This is Ron Real Entrepreneurship, the show that brings the no-nonsense truth of what is required to start, grow, and scale your business. I am your host, Susan Sly. Well, hey, what is up, Raw and Real Entrepreneurs, wherever you are in the world? I hope you are having an incredible day. And like many times before, this particular founder and I started a whole bunch of conversations. And I was like, ugh. I need to hit record. We've talked about everything from China's social credit score to um, India's attempt to implement that 20 years ago with um, microloans to um, all sorts of things to his ex account. And I thought we better start an interview here. So my guest today is a dynamic and accomplished tech entrepreneur. He's also a lot of fun. And throughout his career, he has assumed diverse roles, including enterprise marketing, product management, VC portfolio advisor, and growth officer. Presently, he serves as the CEO of Quolum, which I was all over the website. His prior venture in cloud mobile security was acquired by Oracle, which we're going to talk about what it's like to be acquired. And currently, he is dedicated to developing Qualum, an all-in-one SaaS management and security platform catering to the SaaS requirements of finance, IT, and procurement teams within tech-savvy organizations. And when he isn't contemplating world domination, he has very interesting opinions on X, which I still call Twitter. So I, I will get there, Elon, I will. And my guest today is the founder of Qualum, the one and only Indus Katan. Indus, thank you for being on Raw and Real Entrepreneurship. Hey, Susan, happy, you know, Thursday and great, great, great uh, being on the podcast. Okay, so we're not even going to talk about entrepreneurship. We were talking about how Korean Air is going to start weighing passengers. You you tweet it. It's not called tweeting anymore. What is it called? Xing, as in, you know, real and axe and, you know, you cut <laughs> things down. There are some, there are some people I'd like to be acting out of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> you, you publicly tweet about or X about them and you X them out of your life. Yeah, I, I guess. I guess so. So let's let's jump in and, and talk about that. What the heck? Huh. I think it's fair to say that they are doing it for a reason because, you know, planes have to fly up in the air. They can carry only a certain amount of weight. And there is an assumption that a passenger weighs, let's say, 150 pounds, and that assumption is now 20 years old. We have become obese. We have done enough sugar and carbs. So they want to retest their assumption. So I think that's the fair way to say this. But the way they implemented was absolutely shocking and disgusting. That, hey, come to the airport. We're going to weigh you, and then I'm going to put you on the plane. I mean, are you sure? I'm a passenger. Is that what you're gonna do? You threw through my cabin baggages. You threw my backpacks. Now you're gonna throw me on a scale? Yeah, it's it. It's interesting because it leads into this concept of quantifying human value, right? We were talking about the social credit score, and when you think about what Korean Air is attempting to do, it's like your value to us as a passenger decreases with how much you weigh and whether one, uh, you know, wherever you're listening in the world, you agree or disagree with that sentiment. But then we look at to the extreme and we look at China with the social credit score and how they're quantifying human life and controlling human life. And you, you and I were talking about how in India, they attempted to do this 20 years ago. And could you, could you share that? Since we have many listeners in India, they'll probably say, oh, yeah, we remember that. So this whole concept of micro lending or micro loan came into existence 20 years ago. And does this give a prologue? India doesn't have a credit rating or a mature credit rating, credit profiling system, risk management for an individual, not for a business. It has starting to happen, but not as mature as the United States. Of course, I can complain about the 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 other dark side of the credit scoring system in the United States, there's a different topic. So what happens in India 20 years ago, of course, people need money and they want to spend more, they want to build a business. So if you needed a dollar, who's going to underwrite that dollar? So what they did, they say, oh, let's go to a village. 
let your cohort of villagers underwrite your dollar. Which means if you do not pay back on time or pay back at all, you will be named and shamed in that cohort, in, in that village you live. So your colleagues, your father, your mother, your son-in-law, whosoever it is, they will be called upon saying, hey, Joe hasn't paid. Joe is a bad person. And it starts with a positive attitude, but when money is involved, all emotions are down the drain. And that's what started happening in India. And mm. as a result of that, and this is a shocking part, people committed suicides mm -hmm. because they are not able to pay. And many such programs, when they are called out, they got disbanded, government intervened, and so on and so forth. But it's a very long story. And unfortunately, that's the outcome which is now being implemented in China, as you pointed out, and we know some of the stories that came out of it. And it's not, and thank you for sharing that. It's not just in China or just in India, there, even in the United States, and I'm originally from Canada, when you think about Uber ratings, right? Or Airbnb ratings. So I, when I stay at an Airbnb, I always tell my kids in this, I'm like, leave it better than when you found it. And the we had rented this cottage in Maine over the summer. And I I actually went out, I had made sure they had, my kids had cleaning supplies and I'm like, you, vacuum, yeah. Da, da, da. And and they, um, the, the property manager, she's like, my cleaners have arrived and it's spotless. You put all the laundry through. I said, I did everything but wash the sheets and make the beds. And because I, I'm craving that five-star rating, because if I want a property, I know they're going to gauge my rating over someone else's. It's the same thing with Uber. They'll pick me up or they won't or Lyft. And we're seeing that here. You're in Silicon Valley and you know whether it's it's someone's credit score, it's whether it's someone's rating or if they have a blue check mark, it's starting to permeate here in the United States. And do you think that that type of thing is also potentially going to start to play a role in terms of who gets funded and who doesn't with their startups? Oh, that is a great question. Um... And I'm just thinking deeply, I, I very much remember the goal of ratings was to remove fraud from the system, you know, absolutely. You know, the reason credit scores exist because they don't want to pay to a fraudulent person who's going to take the money and run. In tech, remember, I, I am old enough to remember eBay mm -hmm. and eBay was the first major internet platform to come out with ratings because they were either fraudulent buyers or fraudulent merchants. And the trading system removed the fraud that happened on eBay. It has been like 20 years, and I think we have taken this concept of rating way too far. You know, Uber rides, yeah, if there's an unhappy conversation because of something the driver did, he's going to rate me like one star because I didn't like the way he was speaking to me or he had cigarette smoke in the car or whatever you. And I, I pointed to him and he now rates me at one star. So this is no longer fraud. It has become an emotional rating outcome. I think that's what mm -hmm. it has become. Silicon Valley has been, I would say, to a large part, meritocracy. You know this, I know this. Um, I grew up in India. And I tell you this, nobody would fund an entrepreneur in India with the credentials that I have. Silicon Valley is ready to fund because they don't care about credentials. They care about, are you changing the world? Again, I'm exaggerating. Are you building something useful? Do you have chops to build it? Do you have charisma to get more people involved? Hence, I'm going to give money to you. They don't care who I am, where I grew up, whether I had running water or not. And I feel that the same thing that is happening to Uber and Airbnb very likely gonna happen to venture system because the mm -hmm. number of investors have grown from 1,000 funds 20 years ago to 10,000 funds now. So there are systems that rank and rate founders, uh, sorry, the, the investors. I am sure sooner or later, somebody's gonna say, oh, this entrepreneur did this in his previous startup, let's not fund him. So the pedigree becomes quote unquote, a proxy to the rating. 
and 10 years down the road, we'll have a formal system. And Indus has four stars from his previous startup. Let's not give money to him. Yeah. And it's, I love how you broke that down, Indus, because where my brain went is what's happening in the insurance industry with AI or even in podcasts. So there's AI that will rate the podcast as, um, for advertisers, should they advertise or not? So the the um, NLP will scrub the podcast, and if it's too left or too right or too purple or pink or whatever it is, that then it it rates it on a, a a scale on whether advertisers should advertise. And then we see it in the insurance industry. We're seeing it, you know, with with all sorts of things. And I think it's a matter of time before, if there isn't one that exists for VCs, that it has a variety of inputs, you know, including the founder's social media, their, you know, it could be their credit score, it could be all sorts of things that it pulls to create that rating on whether they're investable or not. And I I see that as something that is coming if it doesn't already exist. Because we've, you know, we've in 2023, depending on when someone's listening to this, we we've heard, you know, on this show that it's the year of no, funding is down. Um, it's, it's a lot trickier. And even for founders like yourself, who've had successful exits, it's, it's a bit of a challenging environment. So let me ask you this question in your current company, did you go for funding or did you bootstrap it? And if so, how is it funded and, and where are you at now in your funding? Yeah, we, we started in 2019 summer with just an idea that, Hey, uh, there is a requirement for buyers to better manage their software stack. So they don't know who has paid for, who bought it. There, is there a security gap? Is there a compliance gap? And with that, we started in summer of 2019. Bootstrapped it for six months. And then we got lucky to get uh, Sequoia and uh, Nexus Venture Partners as our seed investors. And our journey continued from there. So 2020, uh, January, we raised our seed round. We are planning to go raise the next round of our Series A, but the macro conditions are not that great. The market has shifted from a mindset of show me the momentum and I'm going to give you money to show me the deeper bench of customers. So we are in the market, but going to wait this out for another six months before we go out and raise money. Mm. Exactly knowing what you just described, there is a season of no right now. Yeah, I sat down for lunch with a friend of mine who's an LP at a fund, and they were going to disperse 90 million. It's a smaller fund this year. They've dispersed zero dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 he, he said exactly the same thing. You know, they don't know what the, the climate is going to look like, and they're not anticipating anything turning around until maybe Q2. Um, and because it's the raw and real entrepreneurship, you know, we're, we're having um, different, you know, economic thrusters that are either going to be favorable or unfavorable. And it's, it's almost like um, Roman gladiators. Like if you can survive this season, then you can grow a company. When we look back at the the Great Recession in this and, and you know, look at the companies that came out of there in terms of Uber and Airbnb as mentioned and Instagram and all sorts of unicorns and and they were able to survive. So I, I see exactly what you're saying. And VCs are asking um, you to run leaner. Uh, one of the startups I in, invest in, um, that founder is paying himself $40,000 a year. Um, they are at revenue, but he's operating so lean all of his people are working mainly just for options, <laughs> like you know, and 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 I'm seeing VCs wanting that. They it's almost like Fight Club. They're like, okay, if you can survive this, then you know we'll invest in you as soon as you hit these amazing benchmarks. And it's like, wow, okay. <laughs> I think there's a there's a counter thesis to this as well, and and you pointed out very rightly that. The best startups that got built, the Ubers, the Airbnbs of the world, the boxes of the world, the drop boxes of the world, they came out at a time when there was no money supply and nobody was investing any money. So on the contrary, the best companies, not just those that are going to weather the storm, but also the new ones that are going to come out are, gonna, are getting built right now. Mm -hmm. And we will see their names five years down the road, but I think this is also a great time for 
gritty seasoned domain experts to kind of keep building and get started. Yeah, definitely. And I love that you said that. And it 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 was the catalyst for this question I want to ask you is, you know, we in the show, there's there have been hundreds of founders who've shared their stories. Some have had exits for 400 million, 600 million, even billionaires who've been on the show. And one of the things that is always a point of curiosity is going from you have the idea to you actually have a beta product to put out. So how did that happen for you? What was the length of time? How did you get the right people on the bus, so to speak, in order to get to that beta? Like, I'm so curious about that. If, if I tell you the answer, it's a, it's a shocker that we didn't have a product market fit. And I'm going to use the industry lingo uh, until January of last year. So, oh. so if, you, if you see, we started the first lines of code in summer of 2019, the some working version, January of 2020, we didn't have a product market fit until January of last year. So two years. Now, here's the crazy part. We knew that this is going to be needed. We knew that there are 200,000 individual SaaS applications. We knew that we no longer are buying only Oracle, only Microsoft, but buying from hundreds of mid-size and smaller SaaS companies. So our thesis was right, but our market was not ready. Mm. And because COVID happened, people said, huh, I don't need to clean my kitchen. I'm going to just buy whatever I want to buy, come back to you later. So the CFOs would give us a proverbial middle finger. The IT guys would say, hey, I'm busy right now. You know, it's growth, growth, growth. I'm not looking at my back office. We were heads down. We knew this is going to happen. We continue building. And of course, thanks to COVID, the money supply, the, the zip economy we lived in, you know, nobody cared about the back office. January happens last year. Stock market goes down, DocuSign stock gets halved on their stock price. And all of a sudden people wake up saying, oh, I got to clean up the kitchen. I got to remove unwanted products. I got to look at security of these products. And people started responding to our messages, responding to our calls. So it was essentially, I would not use the word sitting out, but knowing that this is going to happen and building towards that goal. And that's what we did. And now we have 50 plus customers. People use our product every day. We are on a mission to reduce software cost. We are on a mission to improve software security. And our journey continues. That's incredible. And it takes a tremendous amount of faith and belief to that point. It's like, we know this is going to come. And for three, you know, well, almost, well, three and a half years, you're, you know, building code. You, how did you go out and pitch it to Sequoia and other VCs before you had actual customers? And, and how did you share the vision of that? So two things uh, we got lucky with. So we pitched in, we pitched where the market was going. We pitched the fact that SaaS is no longer on the fringes. SaaS is mainstream. Today, smaller companies are adopting. Sooner or later, large companies, thousand plus employee companies going to adopt it and in across and all verticals. So that was the thesis. And as a result of that explosion of SaaS, these are the five problems that need to be addressed. Finance is, is going to be in a dire straits. You know, IT is going to worry about all these accounts that are going to be left idle. And hence, somebody has to come in. So they bought into that thesis of what's going to happen. And the SaaS explosion was already kind of a visible on the horizon that's coming. We had a few beta customers who were testing this, but you know that thesis and a few beta customers convinced Sequoia and Nexus to come in. Yeah, that's incredible. And did you know people at those firms? Because there's this um, one of my friends who's a very young founder. He um, he had Andreessen invested. And he, from start to exit, was only two years. And he was a first-time founder who was solving something very specific, but he had a low valuation, low burn. So it was a, a very straightforward exit. 
Um, but did you know people there? Because part of this whole concept of who do you know, who do you know, who do you know, right? And he started to build his network in SV. So he these were warmer introductions than just pitching cold. So I had known both these firms from my previous startup days or acquaintances through you know meeting them at industry events. They have known me from the previous exit that I, I, I had. So that definitely helped get those warm introductions. And, and this is the tale about Silicon Valley that most of the investors are at least one or two hops away. And those warmer introductions, even if you don't know anybody helps. And at the end of the day, they're betting on the market, the product that you're building and the capabilities of the individual. If they know you, that risk is adjusted saying, oh yeah, this guy has done something. If they don't know you directly, somebody else is saying, oh, I'm introducing you to this founder. He sold his previous startup or started a business or is doing something incredible. That takes you the same level as some knowing somebody from the past. Mm. The, speaking of Silicon Valley, we were talking before we went into recording and, and you mentioned something about Silicon Valley. So we have people listening all over the world to the show. So what is one myth about Silicon Valley that is not true? And what is one that is true? <laughs> Great question. So one myth about Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley equals San Francisco, the mm -hmm. city. It is a myth. Silicon Valley is an expansive 50 square mile neighborhood. And I use the word neighborhood because people are connected, they work in common companies and all of that. So it is not San Francisco. San Francisco is a small part. I live 35 miles southeast of San Francisco, the city. And the city I live is a, is a it's called Dublin, Dublin, mm -hmm. California. It has the headquarters of the largest SaaS company, Snowflake. Now, when you think about Snowflake, people say, yes, Snowflake, San Francisco, Bay Area based, and they think they are based out of San Francisco, the city. No, they are based out of the suburbs of San Francisco, far removed from the downtown. That's the myth. And, you know, we are like factory workers, you know, living in bedroom communities, and then our factories are all over the neighborhood. That's the myth, not the downtown, but the whole 50 square mile radius. The second one, which is true, is this huge amount of money and anybody can go get that and get their startups funded. It is very true. You have an idea, you know you can build something, you can go find someone who's two hops away, an angel investor or an, or, an entre, or an entrepreneur or an investor. You get a meeting two weeks out, you go pitch into the fabled offices of Menlo Park on the Sand Hill Road, and you raise your seed round of Series A. Happens more often than not. Mm. The, it's really interesting because the some of the people I know who've had an easier time getting funded, it's because they're in those fabled 50 square miles. And even extending, um, I not that long ago was at NVIDIA's head office because we do a lot of business with NVIDIA and I call it the mothership. It literally looks like a bit of a spaceship. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and that's in Santa Clara which, yeah. you know, I fly into SFO and then I drive and, you know, to your point, you're going to pass all sorts of um, amazing companies by the time you get to NVIDIA and then Intel has a big campus also there. I go running past there at a hotel I stay at, but it's, it's this expansive area and growing. And because of the cost of housing and so forth, I mean, that it's not just one area, but people, again, to your point, who I know get funded, it's like, oh yeah, well that I go to my kid plays soccer with that person's kid and, and, you know, they work at, you know, Andreessen and they just, you know, help fund it. And, and there's a lot of relationship building. How important has expanding your network and cultivating your network been to your success? I think that network is very helpful. 
uh, it helps you validate your thesis of what you're working on, the idea that you have. Somebody will tell you, hey, you're building an IT product. Go talk to this person. He's a CIO at you know, Acme Corp. Just the fact that you have a network, you can navigate to a potential customer. So that proximity definitely helps. Network also tells you as an entrepreneur and that you can do sales because sales is about can you engage? Can you talk to someone? You cannot be sitting in a 10 you know, square you know, room like this and hope that conversations happen. It, it did in the last two years thanks to COVID. But I think we are back to normal. So I think my desire as a founder, so I am an engineer and you, you laugh at this absolutely, Susan. I'm an engineer. I grew up writing code. I was the introvert you would see as a textbook example 15 years ago. Mm. If you came and approached me, I would say, okay, thank you, bye. You know, the words that would make you feel to go away that this person is not interested because I was an introvert. But over the course of 10 years, I trained myself to talk, come on a podcast like yours, if I'm in a, uh, at a get together, I'll be the first one to shake your hand. That was not the case 10 years ago. That was not the case 12 years ago. How did you train yourself to do that? That I, I love that you shared that because there's another myth that all founders are natural extroverts. And there are a lot of founder personas, right? You know, they, whether it's a certain outfit they wear or, you know, whatever, there's all sorts of different founder personas. How did you train yourself to do that? Can I tell you something? And it will shock you. At this moment, one part of my brain is telling me, can this podcast end and I should go away? Yeah. But the other part of the brain is telling me, what a lovely conversation. I can do this all day long. Mm. And that part of my brain that is telling me to get this podcast ended was the dominant part for many, many years. Mm. And I have now learned to train it to, hey, shut the hell up. I am not interested in talking to you. I am talking to Susan. I'm expressing myself. I'm having a great conversation, having a great time. I think it, it first became a practice. I'll give you one fine example. Let's say 10 years ago, I would go to an event saying, oh, I'm going to meet people because, but my introvert self will stop me on the edges of the event. I'll be standing at the corner of the door, just watching from the sidelines, probably mm. grab a drink. And as soon as the event ends, I would run away thinking, ha, ah, nobody's interested in talking to me, but I didn't make any gesture. I didn't initiate. I overcome that using one simple technique. The moment I walk into an event, I go to the center of the event, in the middle, within first minute, I have to greet someone, say hello, start a conversation. I basically practice that as a physical exercise to convert me, to train myself. Mm -hmm. And now it has become a second nature. I walk into an event, I say, hey, Susan, how's your day? We have never met. This is Indus. How's your day going? Wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. You just healed thousands of people around the world in this for sharing that. And that's why we call this raw and real entrepreneurship, because there are, people think like you, that they would think, oh, she, Susan's a natural extrovert. I've had times, um, I remember one time I was in Las Vegas and I was speaking on stage in front of 20,000 people. And afterwards I went backstage and, you know, everyone's like, oh, that was amazing. And, da, da, da. and I literally took a shot of tequila, gave everyone a hug because I was shaking. I went back to my hotel. My husband was with me and I didn't speak to him for three hours because it, I had to, it was like, um, it, it, it takes a lot of energy. And even for the show, when I was um, in 2020, I had gone back to school at MIT and I was like, I know I need to network, but we're all locked in. So, you know, what am I going to do? And I used to do media a very long time ago. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to start my show and I'm just going to have conversations with founders. And I really don't care how many people listen to it. I just want to have a conversation. Like it's two of us having coffee or cocktails with this whole notion that anyone can be an entrepreneur, regardless of what the roadblock is. 
And so thank you for that. I feel like it, you know, that, that was just so healing that it was like that, the beautiful, like, I don't know that, that beautiful sound heard around the world. Thank you for that. Absolutely. I'll, I'll just add one last, uh, you know, sound bite and you love this. I face exactly the same thing as you're facing, you know, after a large event. And so I come home any day and uh, my wife is going to say, hey, go take a shower and remove that theater from your head. Basically, there is so much anxiety gets built in because mm. we are not naturally ex extrovert. Now we have trained ourselves, but we need to unwind ourselves and that hot shower or removing the theater, as my wife calls it, that brings us to a natural state. Mm, I love your wife. <laughs> what is her first name? <laughs> Jyoti, J-Y-O-T-I, Jyoti. Jyoti. Well, tell her that I, that is wonderful wisdom. I, uh, I will come home and I'll get on the Peloton and I'll just like spin and spin and spin and just not talk to anyone. And, and you and I were chatting prior to going to the show and I'm about the day I'm doing the show, I'm about I'm doing three shows and then I'm leaving to go speak at the Voice and AI conference in um, Washington, D.C. And then I speak at the Women in Tech conference um, with uh, HPE in New York City with NVIDIA. And then um, I go the following week to Austin to speak for Lenovo. And then I go somewhere else, somewhere else. And then I go to Toronto in um, for the, the Women in AI Awards. And it's like, I just go back to my hotel room and I just put on like a cooking show and I just don't talk to anyone. <laughs> Bingo. Bingo. Yes. I, I and and shouts out to the Food Network. Thank you for my therapy. Um, and I'm I'm a big fan of therapy. Well, let me ask you this: What do you do to, um, in addition to the shower at the end of the day? But what do you do in the morning? Do you have a morning routine to get your head on straight to go into the day? Because obviously, as an engineer, you're very involved in the you know the all sorts of aspects of your company from the technological. Um, state of of how the tech is delivered to patches to we could go on and on and on, um, and then you know you're you're the founder, so you're overseeing sales and marketing and and the vision of the company. So how do you do you have a morning routine that sets you up for the day? I don't have a fixed routine. I basically get guided by my calendars. My day begins at eight thirty. Like my calendar begins at eight thirty. My day begins roughly at around seven. Three days in a week, I attempt to go to gym. Some some days it's two days in a week. Some days it's three days in a week. I keep it flexible, and 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 the reason I say that because if I put it on a calendar, I'll find a reason to not go. Mm. I don't put it on a calendar. Say, oh, I didn't go to the gym this week. Okay, let's go. And it that 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 fragility of that appointment makes me do it even more rather than mm. the rigidity of that appointment. So go to the gym three days in a week, I get up in the morning, lounge around the house, chat with my wife for like 20, 30 minutes, you know, general, um, you know, doing random things at home and get on the calls, do the sales meetings in the morning, um, find a break in the calendar, go grab a cup of tea, talk to her again, um, eleven thirty. We don't do breakfast, so we are a two meal family. So we do a brunch at around eleven thirty, eleven forty, and then my second shift begins in the afternoon. So more more stuff to be done, more meetings, things that I have assigned to myself. Work on those, and then take a break at around four thirty five p.m. Um, this is our family room, by the way. I, again, if you're recording this, I have two little boys. We have a TV on the left here, so they sometimes hide behind this table underground and play PlayStation. Nobody sees them. They have AirPods on. I'm working. I'm doing a Zoom call. They are enjoying the game. And 5.30, she comes here. We grab a cup of tea. Uh, we enjoy our time. She has something on TV. She watches. I kind of contribute to it. And the second shift ends at around that time. And then my third shift begins, which is I have a cross-border team in India around 
for around a couple of hours in the day. I love that you went through that in this because it is raw and real. Like, you know, when people hear Silicon Valley founder, they're like, um, they're, you know, they think about movies and, you know, you're in like a, you know, a, a $78 million mansion and, you know, all this stuff. And that's as raw and real as it gets. And having the kids um, during the pandemic, my daughter was having a really hard time with being at home and school. And I moved a desk into my office and I was doing her grade five math with her. And then I'd be like on a conference call and I'd be like, okay. And I said, she's getting a PhD right now. She is an MBA. She's getting a PhD. She's learning about edge computing. She is learning edge to cloud. She is learning IoT. She is learning AI. She is learning everything in addition to her grade five math. You know, like she was learning it all. And I love that you said that. I have a final question for you. You know, you you've had this exit. You're building this new company. And Wayne Gretzky, great Canadian. I'm from Canada. Um, I know you love cricket, so I'm going to use a hockey analogy because I can't think of a cricket one. Um, Wayne Gretzky said, you skate to where the puck is going. And you talked about that. Like you with Qualum, you, 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 you knew where things were going and you could see it so clearly. And yet hindsight is also 2020. So if you could go back in time, is there something that you would have done differently? You know, give advice to entrepreneurs, whether they're in Nigeria, they're in India, they're in the UK, wherever they are listening. What is something you would have done or you wish someone would have told you like in this, do this and you wish you would have known? I wish I knew COVID was coming. I would not have started during COVID. <laughs> that, that would definitely I would have done. You um, and billions of people wish they do that. <laughs> <laughs> I would have just happily taken time off, worked remotely, you know, traveled around the world and not worry about the startup that I am. Jokes apart, it, respect, it was a great time to start. I think one thing I always struggled in, and this nobody told me earlier, is figure out whether you are building a product which is in a brand new category or in mm. a category that already exists. Uh, mm. To simplify an example being is, is my product a better banana or a brand new fruit itself? Mm. That's so good. And I struggle with it initially. Now I have a rationalization in my head because what you try to build is going to be your destiny. Whether you'll be able to raise money, how you're going to acquire customers, do you as a founder have resilience to survive because a better banana anybody could want, a, a new fruit, nobody knows about it. I don't even know how it's going to taste, how it's going to look, how much it's going to cost. So be ready for that risk you're going to take, you know, the, the relationships you're going to test and your family that's going to endure with you. And if I had known I would have taken a slightly different path, even for the current company. Mm. What a great analogy that it's so resonated with me. And that's why I love these conversations. Like we, we came in to computer vision, the company um, in Delaware C was signed late 2017. So we started in computer vision in 2018 with multi-camera tracking. And then in the retail sector and very specialized sector that we're in, to your point, no one had heard of this. And then now we're, you know, there are a lot of people saying, well, we want computer vision and we want AI, but we just don't know what we really want. And, you know, there was a, the, this, to your point, it wasn't a banana, it was a new fruit and people were not sure that they even wanted this fruit. And now they kind of know they want the fruit because they've heard that the benefits of the fruit are fabulous, but you know, it's like, how do they, and so I so get that. And, um, and, and category creation for a founder is tough. And I know if people are up for a challenge, like you are, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but for people who don't do well with challenge to your point and you use the word risk, it can feel really risky because you have to outmarket anyone. And my one of my mentors said, Susan, you have to outhabit anyone. 
And in category creation, you have to outmarket everyone. And so, Indus, that is beautiful wisdom. I can't thank you enough for being here. Hopefully, you won't need a shower after this. Give my best to Gioti. She is an angel and a saint um, for putting up with her founder husband because it takes, it takes, uh, I've been with my husband for 23 years and it takes the right kind of person to put up with people like us. Uh, hats off to her. Absolutely. <laughs> well, everyone, um, follow Indus on X. Um, he's absolutely fabulous. It's one N D U S, and all of his social and Qualum social will be in the show notes. If the show has benefited you, especially if you are an introvert and it's giving you courage, and especially if you have an engineering mind like Indus does, and and can really benefit from what he shared, um, we would love a five star review. I'm going to be bold and ask for that. And please share the show. Tag us. We're active on um, LinkedIn and X. Um, sometimes Instagram when I'm in the mood to be very candid. But anyway, with that, Indus, thank you so much for being here thank you susan thank you for those questions you know really brought out some of my thoughts appreciate that absolutely well thank you i feel like you have a best-selling book that could really help a lot of people so um folks you heard it here on the show um indus you really do that so many people struggle with that i can't even tell you so after you exit this one just maybe a pause and a book would be a really good thing so just a pro tip as a new friend anyway um everyone wherever you are in the world uh, thank you for being here i so appreciate you and with that god bless go rock your day and i will see you in the next episode Are you currently an employee looking to start your own business? Maybe you've been thinking about it for a while and you're just not sure where to start. Well, my course, Employee to Entrepreneur, combines my decades of experience as an entrepreneur with proven methods, techniques, and skills to help you take that leap and start your own business. This course is self-paced, learn on demand, and comes with an incredible workbook. And that will allow you to go through this content piece by piece by piece, absorb it, take action, and then go on to the next module. So check out my course on susansly.com, Employee to Entrepreneur.